All right, um, before we go into sharing the, the findings from our housing analysis, I wanted to start with just doing giving a brief overview of the scope of the housing analysis, and specifically the scope of housing in terms of how the Charleston City Plan um, can and will address housing. So per state law, the Charleston City Plan being the city's comprehensive plan has to address um, these, these topics specifically. So what our current, what's the state of our current housing stock, including affordability? Um, what are our current and future housing needs are taking into consideration population projections? Uh, in what ways are we hindering the creation of affordable housing in terms of um, regulations, codes, and how can we encourage affordable housing development? So these are all questions that are part of the housing element it's in the Comprehensive Plan um, Act. And I also wanted to be specific about when we're talking about affordability and specifically in this housing analysis, we'll say the word, we'll use the term affordable housing a lot. Um, and there's a lot of different definitions for that depending on um, what space you're in uh, and uh, whether it's you're referring to city code or a funding source. Um, but we're using the affordable, ho affordable housing term broadly for the purposes of this housing analysis. Um, so, and we're basing it off of a, a, the standard that is created by the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development or HUD. Their standard definition for what is affordable is when housing expenses add up to 30% or less of a household's annual income, and that's before taxes. Sorry, um, and and so they calculate affordability for different households, or they um, create different categories of affordability based on uh, the percentage that a household makes of the area's median income. So, a single person household area median income for Charleston is fifty six thousand seven hundred, and that that household makes fifty six thousand seven hundred annually. So, if you see something that says this is affordable for households making 60% AMI, um, then that means that it's affordable for households making, single household making 34,020 or below. So that's just one example. Um, and these numbers vary depending on household size. Um, so there's a whole table with, uh, with what those numbers are. I'm just showing you a snapshot here just for single household. And so for this housing analysis, when we say affordable housing, we're including all housing affordable to households making up to 120% the AMI. That includes low income housing. So we're talking all uh, from 0% to 120% of the area median income. Uh, as you've heard, there are a lot of uh, staff from our Department of Housing and Community Development on the call uh, and they play a very important role in the creation of affordable housing. The Department of Planning, Preservation, Sustainability works very closely with them. Um, we do have a, a separate, um, our tools are a little bit different than their tools, but we use them together for the creation and preservation of affordable housing. So specifically, the Department of Planning, Preservation, Sustainability uses uh, policy tools and planning tools that can allow for greater variety of housing types, uh, we can create incentives for developers to create afford more affordable housing. We can uh, generate funding for affordable housing through um, fees and other, um, other tools. And we can also make housing more affordable by minimizing regula regulatory barriers. The Department of Housing and Community Development administers funding from a variety of sources to create affordable housing uh, specifically for low to moderate income families. And again, low to moderate income, that's based on a specific range um, that, uh, of households making a certain area median income. And then uh, City of Charleston Housing Authority is charged with administering local public housing funds for low and very low income families. So that's typically what you see 60%, 30% below the area median income. Um, and that's uh, what, uh, if you've heard the term low income housing, it's typically what's being referred to there, but we all are working together um, for the creation and preservation of affordable housing uh, that's receiving some kind of subsidy or, or deed restricted um, uh, uh, measure to ensure affordability for a, a time period or in perpetuity. 
So for this housing analysis, um, we needed better data first uh, to really understand our housing challenges. So we contracted with community data platforms, uh, specializes in an data analytics to provide us with a comprehensive snapshot of our existing housing stock. And we also wanted to make sure that we had a, a strong definition of the problem um, that in, incorporated the community's perspective in terms of what, what are our challenges um, so that we're asking the right questions from the data. And so we had four housing labs, uh, which were virtual community listening sessions focused on housing that those took place in the fall. And so from these two efforts, from the data analysis, uh, housing labs, and then also responses from our city plan survey, uh, where we received over 2,500 responses, um, the housing analysis focuses on um, these three things. Uh, first is just establishing a baseline. So. Um, excuse my dog. <clears throat> uh, so how much of Charleston's existing housing stock is affordable and to whom? And then beyond housing costs, we wanted that this came up a lot in listening sessions. That's not just the cost of housing. There's many more barriers to housing and much more that comes into play for housing choice. Um, and so uh, specifically we looked at as well, how do transportation costs influence affordability of housing? And then the third one here is still a work in progress, but I wanted to mention it to make sure um, that we're communicating that this is something that is um, going to be part of this uh, in the long term, especially. And uh, that is gentrification and displacement, which came up a lot again in the community conversations. And so looking at which communities are experiencing the most change and which communities are at the highest risk of displacement. And so uh, that's just an introduction of what you'll expect to see from these findings and the scope that they're addressing. So any questions or thoughts? And I'll pass it to Tatika to facilitate this Q&A. Thank So I'm sure that was a lot that was shared with you um, very quickly, especially if this is your first time. What I normally like to do is ask if there's, a, if one person can share just one question. Um, and I'm sure you have multiple that you might be thinking of or might be wanting to wait, but is there something you'd like to ask in response to what Chloe shared? Um, I don't mind getting started and chiming in. Sure, can I, thank you. I did appreciate that you included um, transportation as a factor in housing affordability, because it is a reality that no matter where you live, there is some kind of co uh, transportation cost associated with getting to and from work, proximity to your job, whether it's you're paying for gas, whether it's your bicycle that you have to maintain more often or taking the bus. So I, I think that is a factor that's generally overlooked. And, and I guess I would just commend you guys for, for thinking of that. Thank you for your feedback, Kenneth. Anyone else before we move forward? Okay. And Chloe, I do have a quick question. Is is transportation normally considered or is this the first first year you all are doing this with this part? Um, transportation is always a part of the comprehensive plan. So that is another element of a comprehensive plan. But in terms of looking at transportation costs in a housing analysis to understand affordability, I believe this is um, the first time that we've looked at it in a comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. um, Gianna may, may say more. Um, I believe it was factored in for the Housing for a Fair Charleston report. And Gianna, do you want to mention that briefly? Yes, it was. I've been trying to be quiet so other people can talk. But um, we had it included in the plan the, um, because of the amount or the percentage that transportation costs play in a family's budget or in a household's budget. And so it was mentioned there that it represents 30% of costs for families, which um, can certainly pivot a family into being even more cost burdened if they're already paying over 30% of their income for housing. Thank you. Thank you, Gianna. And I just wanna add, uh, just for note, if you look into the chat, um, 
we welcome Cash and Ryan. Thank you so much for, or actually Ryan, I already shared when you were here, but um, for Cash, is it Cashian? I don't know if I'm saying that right. I hope I'm not butchering it, um, but- uh, It's Cashian. Cashian, thank you. I appreciate thank that. Thank you. I, I'm, my name is very distinct, so I like to make sure I say it correctly. Thank you for correcting me. Um, all right, and she's with the Historic Charleston Foundation. And we have Julie Hicks that's also here, resident of, she's new to Mount Pleasant and from Atlanta. Um, thank you for being here. And if you look into the chat, you can also see where Jim dropped two specific links for you to refer to for additional information. So just want to, uh, it's the one for housing for fair Charleston report. And then he did another one for the 2020 Department of Housing and Community Development Consolidated Plan, just for reference, if you all want to refer back to that. All right. I think we're ready to move on. Thank you for everyone's thoughts and feedback. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I think um, I think we'll probably get a lot more questions after this session uh, section of our presentation, uh, which is great. Um, but so we wanted to present to you some of our uh, key data findings, and then uh, Chloe's going to present some of our um, community engagement findings related to housing. Um, so we'll begin. Um, we were curious about um, kind of our numbers of construction. We know that construction, housing construction has increased over the past 10 years. Um, and specifically here, uh, this chart is showing you our housing growth rate, uh, which is basically the new uh, units that are constructed uh, as a percentage of the existing units. And so here you can see um, kind of some of the cities uh, that we know to be hot for housing, you know, uh, Greenville is, is kind of leading the way there uh, in our region, uh, but then Durham and Raleigh, obviously we know about growth in those cities. Um, and you can see that Charleston ranks pretty highly. Um, and so I think this makes sense when you consider that over the past 10 years, we've had a 20% increase in population in our region and a 13% uh, population increase in the city of Charleston. Um, so you can see that that demand uh, is driving construction um, and we're seeing a lot of it. Um, next slide. And uh, so another, another thing that we, we wanted to understand was the relationship between income and, uh, and housing costs. And if those, uh, those two are rising at a, a proportionate rate. Um, and what we found was that uh, household incomes have not risen uh, as quickly as household costs have. Um, or housing costs, I should say. Um, and so we see that median rent and home sales have increased by 51 and 54% respectively, uh, whereas income uh, only increased by 31%. Um, and so I think a lot of us, uh, if anyone's been looking for uh, an apartment to rent or a house to buy, um, we can see this, you know, very, uh, it's very prevalent. Um, but I think one thing that we really wanted to point out is that uh, not only are our rents or wages not keeping up with housing costs, but uh, for for uh, black households in the city of Charleston, um, it's even even more dire. The situation um, we see that between uh, 2010 and 2020, our gap uh, income gap between white and black households actually increased, um, and so uh, we we definitely wanted to think about that as we. Uh, as we went through our housing analysis. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so all of this kind of adds up when we think about wages and housing costs. Um, it kind of leads us to uh, this cost burdenness. Uh, it's something we're very interested in. And as Chloe uh, mentioned before, cost, uh, it, a household is cost burdened when they spend more than 30% of their income on housing costs. Um, and so, what we see in the city, um, and this is coming from our uh, data from community data platforms, is that 42% of Charleston households are cost burden. So they're paying more than 30% of their income on uh, rent or home ownership costs. Um, but we see that, you know, just like incomes haven't increased uh, proportionately um, between black and white residents, um, we see that neighborhoods um, with the majority of black residents are more than twice as likely to be cost burdened as those with the majority of white residents. 
Um, and to figure that, to find that figure, we kind of looked at all of the neighborhoods um, and found uh, neighborhoods that had a, uh, a majority, so over 50% of the households within that neighborhood were cost burdened. And then we looked at the percentage of uh, white neighborhoods uh, where that was the case and black neighborhoods where that was the case or predominantly black neighborhoods and predominantly white neighborhoods. And so uh, we can see that this is uh, dis disproportionate, this impact here. Um, and, and I think a, a lot of people, you know, see that in their own communities too. And we heard that a lot during our engagement um, in our first round of engagement. So go to the next slide. Um, and so you know, we see that this 42% of all Charleston households are uh, cost burdened. Um, and so obviously uh, one way to reduce cost burdenness uh, citywide is to, is to provide more affordable housing opportunities for people. Um, and so we uh, looked and, and tried to find counts for each of the five areas of our city uh, with community data platforms. And so you can see those figures on that map uh, within those circles. Um, so the totals are, you know, about 700 for the Canehoy Peninsula, um, a little under 5,000 for the Charleston Peninsula, a little over 6,000 for West Ashley, a little bit over 2,500 for Johns Island, and about 1,900 for James Island. And so this is uh, the, the amount of affordable units that are needed uh, by 2030. Um, and this is just to make sure, just to uh, kind of give get us back to even where we have enough units uh, for the amount of uh, uh, people earning under 120% AMI uh, that live in these areas right now. Um, and so, you know, another thing that we found through this data analysis was that uh, we have the greatest need for affordable housing uh, for those making 30% or less uh, AMI. And so we found that uh, when we looked at just that income group, we need about 7,000 units uh, citywide to meet the demand for, for people that are earning less than 30% AMI. Next slide, please. Um, and so, you know, when we think about affordable housing units, oftentimes we think about deed restricted housing, uh, which is basically um, housing units that have uh, been uh, designated or been provided through public funding. I'm gonna mute somebody real quick, sorry. <laughs> Got a little distracted there with the phone call. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so when we think about affordable housing, oftentimes we think of uh, publicly subsidized housing or housing that is being paid for uh, either through uh, state uh, tax incentives or, or local uh, funds. Um, uh, and so we were curious to see you know, of our existing affordable housing units, and that is units affordable to under 120% AMI, you know, what percentage of those are publicly subsidized or deed restricted? And so what we found is that, you know, we have actually about 76,000 housing units that are affordable to households under 120% AMI, but only 6% of those are uh, deed restricted um, as low income and workforce housing, which means that you know, for that for that other seventy thousand units, uh, we we have very little control over keeping those units affordable uh, for people. So, you know, when we have public dollars put into this, then we have a little bit more control over how long uh, these units are going to be affordable for, at what income levels uh, are these rents capped at, uh, and things like that. Um, so that's something that we were that we really stood out during this analysis. And. I think this is my last little data data slide. So, um, uh, so yeah. So I think uh, Kenneth hit the nail on the head with thinking about transportation um, and its relationship to housing costs. And that was something we we really wanted to answer from the get go. Um, and so here, this this table uh, to your right here is showing you uh, the average transportation costs for households around the city, and then those the average housing costs. For those households, and so obviously, um, you know, this is uh, irrespective to uh, things like uh, number of bedrooms or number of bathrooms. And so, those, uh, you know, for example, on the Charleston Peninsula, you know, a three-bedroom is going to be more expensive than a three-bedroom on Johns Island. Um, and so, you know, we're just looking at the average amount that people are spending on rent or home ownership. Um, 
but yeah, so we can see that transportation really, uh, really does pay, a, you know, play a significant role in people and people's availability to live in different places around the city. Um, and especially uh, places that are more car dependent are end, end up spending a lot more. And so, you know, we see John's Island of the peninsula in the, in the overall are, are paying almost uh, the same when you take into account transportation costs. Like I said, you know, household size is a big factor uh, that we're talking about here. Um, but, you know, we wanted to think about other, other factors that contribute to housing choice as well. So, uh, you know, household size, family size, some people aren't able to live in uh, certain neighborhoods because they need uh, a certain type of house. Um, yeah, so, oh, and then uh, here at the bottom is another really important uh, little tidbit um, that you know, 6% of our residential parcels are vulnerable, to, will be vulnerable to tidal flooding with three feet of sea level rise. So what we're seeing is that our housing stock not only is in short supply now, it's actually uh, being restricted due to sea level rise over time. Um, and so that's something we really need to think about too. And then I'm gonna kick it over to Chloe to talk about our uh, housing engagement. Thanks, Jim. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, um, uh, the city plan survey was another place where we gathered data. We wanted to understand um, uh, the community's experience with housing. And so we had some questions in there. In response to, are you concerned about being able to stay in your housing, in your current housing? Um, the re these are the responses we received, um, uh, varying from not concerned at all to somewhat concerned to very concerned. And so I've broken it down by area here for those of you who are calling in and can't see um, the screen, uh, I have south of Calhoun, it's about 39% somewhat concerned, 13% very concerned, Midtown uh, Peninsula, 42% somewhat concerned, 12% very concerned. The neck area is 33% somewhat concerned, 8% very concerned. Inner West Ashley, 32% somewhat concerned, 8% very concerned. Outer West Ashley, 27% somewhat concerned, 7% very concerned. James Island is 33% somewhat concerned, 8% very concerned. Johns Island, 31% somewhat concerned, 8% very concerned. And then Canoy Peninsula, 18% somewhat concerned, 4% very concerned. Um, I regret reading that out loud. It's when you pick a bad karaoke song. Um, but uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, but I think it's one thing I wanted to point out with this is that um, we, uh, we did not get represent, uh, responses repre representational of the city's population. Um, and so we uh, looked at, we pulled out the results from the survey uh, to look specifically at the responses from those groups that were underrepresented survey results. And specifically those groups were lower income individuals and households. Um, black households, uh, tenants, uh, being those who rent, uh, uh, youth, and um, there were a couple areas of the city that were not well represented. And so I um, did want to point out that in terms of being concerned about being able to stay in current housing, those percentage points were 10 points higher, which is a pretty big jump among Black, black African American and Upper Peninsula respondents. Um, and more than 20 points higher among lower income respondents, youth and tenants. So looking at the reasons that people reported for uh, concern, um, I broke it out. Uh, so this is from, these are open-ended responses and I went through and tabulated um, the, the patterns uh, that appeared multiple times from responses um, flooding, sea level rise, and hurricanes were very high. Um, it, but if you add up all of the responses that were related to affordability, being cost of living versus income, escalating rent prices, escalating home ownership costs, uh, job or income insecurity, can't afford to move, can't afford to buy. So they're renting and they want to buy, but they can't afford to buy. Um, flood insurance. Uh, and cost of home maintenance. So all of these are dealing with you know, being able to afford where they live or where they want to live. Um, when you combine all of those reasons, it's 60% of all respondents cited one of those as their primary yeah. multiple, as their primary reason for being concerned about their ability to stay in their current housing. 
Um, so I've also included in here just to show, you know, people who reported not at all, uh, why were they not concerned? So uh, naturally, because they're financially secure, job security, um, or they've moved somewhere else where they were able to afford it, um, uh, or they bought when it was affordable, but now they can't afford to move. They're high and dry, uh, so they're not worried about flooding. They've paid off their home, um, or they're they're not worried, but they're worried about their neighbors. So, um, very very interesting, illuminating responses there. And then finally, I'll end with uh, some of the themes, the or the main themes that came out of the housing labs. And uh, for those of you just joining, those housing labs are from the fall when we held four virtual community listening sessions focused on housing and the, issue, and the topics of affordability, displacement, um, and uh, housing recommendations. So um, gentrification, displacement, causing people to lose their physical and cultural sense of place. So just, it's not just about um, uh, not being able to afford where you live, but it has these other implications as well in terms of livability and quality of life. Um, the beyond cost, beyond uh, rent or mortgage, home maintenance um, is, is, a, is a concern, especially for elderly residents. High eviction rate, so even if you're able to afford housing um, at, at one point, um, being able to stay in your housing, there's barriers beyond cost. Um, being stuck in substandard housing, so maybe it's affordable um, but uh, your the quality of the housing is poor, but you can't afford to move somewhere else. Absentee landlords came up. Um, uh, neighborhoods, not necessarily. Uh, this wasn't related to affordability necessarily, but in terms of understanding gentrification, it's not just about uh, one of the impacts is not just displacement, but also when neighborhoods become consumer destinations. And this was specifically about downtown. And, um, and, and no longer neighborhoods. It's less of a place to live and, and, and more of a, a place for people to come and um, spend. And uh, then rising property taxes and land values. Um, so obviously this, this impacts affordability, increasing the profit motive, and, this will, and worries that this will only can continue to worsen with sea level rise. And then again, flood insurance costs and then flood damage. So being able to afford to build back um, when there is a disaster or a severe flood. So um, why does housing affordability matter? This is just a summation of sort of everything that we've talked to up to this point, the so displacement, being able to afford to stay in uh, long-time neighborhoods, being able to stay in housing, um, homelessness, when you're not able to stay in housing or uh, not able to obtain housing in the first place, increased traffic, moving further away from where you work, where you go to school, um, you know, your, your family, your communities puts more cars on the road for having to drive longer distances. And then our economic health. So especially smaller uh, businesses being able to attract and keep employees um, when, when there are no affordable housing options nearby is, is, um, is difficult. And this came up in conversations with local businesses as well. So these are all, um, things that impact all of our community, not just those who are looking for more affordable housing. And so um, it's why we wanted to keep this front and center for the city plan. Thank you, Chloe. All right, so um, I don't have to, I'm sure, should not have to ask if there's a question. If you are not, if you don't have a question, then something must be wrong. So, um, or if you have a thought, um, and that's just being honest. I mean, we, we live in a beautiful city. However, um, as stated by what Chloe shared and by what Jim shared that we, there's also, there's a low representation of the population that is most impacted that participated in this. So these numbers could actually be way higher than they are. So um, I'd like to just get the conversation going to hear if you have any questions, if you have any thoughts, you have the housing team in front of you, um, please do ask your questions so that you can feel like you were heard or just if you wanna give, have, if you have any thoughts or feedback. 
Jim, before everyone jumps in, when you defined low income, was the, were you looking at a certain percentage of AMI when you talked about that figure? Yeah, that was, um, uh, I should have been more clear there. That was uh, referring to the 30% and below okay. AMI. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I have a question. Um, when we talked about, I know we talked about transportation costs as being a, an additional burden, but did you also consider folks who, did you, the daily food, uh, the ability to, to be able to eat daily, um, insurance, like health insurance, um, um, life insurance, those kinds of things. And, you know, they have a lot of elderly people that have uh, grandchildren and nieces and nephews and all that living with them. Um, that additional burden uh, is also something they have to absorb. So the question is, were there any other things included, burden included, other than the transportation costs? That's my first question. Well, uh, yeah, I think it's, that's a really great question. Um, and the short answer is no, we didn't include um, auxiliary, auxiliary costs uh, such as food or health insurance or other things like that. Uh, I think it would have been really, it would have helped inform it. Uh, we just kind of had a limited scope here. Um, and we knew that transportation is one thing that is directly um, related to housing, just in a spatial geographic way. Um, but I, I think, uh, I think, yeah, you, I mean, these are other factors that we would have loved to, to bring into our analysis for sure. Okay. Yeah, Eddie, that's a great question. I'm going to show a quick, um, this is on the website, on the Charleston City Plan website. It, ha it has more data. Um, if, if folks, this is, this is a, we tried to get it, consolidate it down so we had time to discuss, um, but there is more data on our, our, on our website if people want to dig deeper. And so just this shows a, a broader um, picture in terms of cost of living in Charleston. So we rank high in cost of living, second to Washington, D.C., sort of these regional comparison cities, um, which, is, which is significant considering that our uh, area median income is much lower than Washington, D.C.'s. And so you can see here which, which of those um, uh, categories bring that number up and how those, you know, how is healthcare compared to other areas, utilities compared to other mm. areas. So this data is up there. And I would say just adding on to Jim, um, you know, uh, this came up in listening sessions too. It's not, you know, it's not just housing costs. There's all these other things, insurance for sure. I think we, we picked transportation to gather the, um, uh, to get data on uh, because it is something that uh, in a plan, in terms of land use decisions and planning policy, we can more directly impact than healthcare costs um, or insurance costs. Those things are a little bit further out, um, or, or definitely outside of our control. Um, and, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't still be considering them as a city and factoring them in. And we heard very loud and clear through survey results and listening sessions that the cost of living generally in Charleston is very, very expensive and wages are just not keeping up or they're just not enough to keep up with it. Um, and so uh, that's, um, it, that is, that is, we wanna make sure at least that we're communicating that it's not just transportation, it's not just housing costs, that's uh, cost of living in general here is, is, is too high um, for the wages that people make. Thank you, ma'am, thank you. <clears throat> Chloe, I have a question. Um, do you think when we looked at the part of the survey that showed the concern or not really concern, <clears throat> and we looked at the various locations, um, in particular the islands, you think it, what we may have not um, have data on is um, people who moved to the area once you move in, you normally can afford the property that you're buying if you moved in from out of town in comparison to someone who is concerned because they're living in place and they've already, they've always been there. And I don't know if that was somewhere um, captured or can be captured with the data, especially downtown when they 
move and are able to afford the houses compared to what is lost due to um, hotel, commercial, real estate, you know, displacement and people who actually are there trying to survive? That's a great question. We did not pull that, um, we did not cross-reference this data with that question, um, but we can. I believe we did ask in the survey how long people have lived, um, how long people have been a part of uh, the Charleston community. And yeah. so um, I believe we can pull out that answer. That That's a great be, question. Yeah, that would be interesting. Thank you, Deborah. Are there any additional thoughts or questions? I don't see anything in the chat either. Just wanted to make sure before we keep going. Okay. Sandy, yes, I see. I, yeah, thank you. I have a question. Um, when it comes to solutions to this, one, one obvious solution is, is increasing the amount of um, affordable housing that's built. But because we have such, uh, on the peninsula and other areas, it's so, there's not a lot of land. And from what I understand, the incentives that, that are provided to the builders are, they're not taking advantage of the opportunity to build in um, affordable housing. So what is, what is the um, thoughts on the existing um, housing stock and improving that housing stock um, to allow people to, to maintain their houses on the peninsula, specifically the peninsula, because I know there's so many different areas, but that was just my question. That, um, I, I think that we might answer your question in the next section where we're going through the rec our draft recommendations and um, community's input regarding recommendations as well. So um, definitely hold that and let's uh, go through the next section and then if we still haven't answered it, then we can address it then. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, we'll keep going. Okay. In the survey, we included a question offering some examples of housing solutions that other cities have used to increase the amount of stable housing for all income levels uh, and to gauge people's support for some of these different strategies, including encouraging smaller private yards and more shared community open space, encouraging mixed income development, which is a term to uh, referring to when there's both market rate and subsidized housing in the same development, um, allowing attached style housing such as townhomes con and condominiums, allowing duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes, and more flexibility for building design and architectural standards. So we saw strong support for the first three, uh, not as much support for duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, and flexibility for building designs and architectural standards. Um, but I did want to note, again, pulling out the responses from the populations that were underrepresented in survey results. Among Black and African-American respondents, lower income respondents, youth, tenants, Upper Peninsula residents, there was more support for all tools, with the exception that only 30%, 38%, so less than overall results of Black African-American respondents were in support of the smaller private yards and more shared community open space um, strategy. So the way I'm gonna present this is um, I'm gonna start with recommendations that came out of both the housing labs and in the, um, in the there was an other, an option for in this last question here, uh, there was an option that says other. So people could write in uh, a recommendation or a strategy that they would have liked to, they'd like to see the city pursue. So looking through all of those other responses and also the notes from the listening sessions in the fall uh, these were recommendations that, that the community put forward. So I'm gonna start with recommendations and then follow up with uh, the, what staff have put together for draft, a draft recommendations for the city plan responding 
to uh, these suggestions and what we heard and also responding to the data. So the first category of categorized it by um, two, two groups of recommendations. One that's relating to housing to diversity in general. So not um, uh, specifically affordable housing, but just increasing housing diversity. And then the second category is specific to creation of affor affordable housing being designated affordable housing. So the community expressed that we need more housing for all income levels, life stages and household sizes need a mixture of housing types. We need to build up and in, not out. So preventing sprawl. So, and that gets back to, you know, the further away you move, even if it's more affordable, that's the further you're driving on the road. Um, so building up and in would keep um, people closer to work, to their communities, allowing smaller homes and lots, encouraging sustainability and allowing for creativity tiny homes, putting housing above commercial. So uh, what we also often call mixed use development when there's both housing and commercial and the same development, increasing densities um, and improving public transportation option, options. So the, and Jim, are you, are you presenting this? I I yeah, I, this. I can, okay. I can. Okay. <laughs> I can remember. Either way. Um, yeah, so um, these are four recommendations that directly relate uh, to some of the uh, community input that Chloe just shared. Um, number one, uh, encourage diversity of housing types. And I'm not going to read through all of them because, uh, you know, for the interest of time. And I, I'm, I'm thinking that we're going to share all these out after the session uh, as well, that you can pick through each of these. But um, so strongly encourage a diversity of housing types. Um, so that includes things, uh, you know, known as missing middle housing, uh, which is kind of a buzzword right now um, uh, that, you know, is duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, um, and allow by right and more based zoning districts. Um, and then, you know, number two, encourage uh, mixed use and mixed income uh, developments. Uh, so that's uh, market rate and subsidized units in the same uh, development, and then also multiple um, uses such as commercial and residential in the same development. Um, and then, you know, making sure that those types of developments are in close proximity to uh, amenities that people uh, are interested in living near. Um, and then, you know, we, we especially called out the uh, low, low country rapid transit route um, for an area that we need to incentivize uh, transit oriented development. Um, and some of that mixed use and mixed income and also uh, affordable housing development. Um, and then number three, uh, update the zoning ordinance to apply conservation design principles. Um, so, you know, looking at, you know, where are high ground and where are uh, low ground uh, and uh, or where, you know, our ecosystems and clusters of trees are uh, that we can preserve through the development process. Um, number four is to allow more flexibility for building design and architectural standards where appropriate, um, just to, you know, uh, just to make sure that we can, you know, incentivize these types of things that we're recommending and these other, you know, three uh, recommendations here. And the second group being specifically uh, recommendations uh, from the community for affordability and housing security. So prioritizing investing in longtime black residents and, and business owners, investigate the disproportionate impact of the Board of Architectural Review Standards and other regulatory codes. In general, providing support and education to tenants. So this is some uh, eviction prevention type uh, strategies. Collaborating regionally. So it's not just a local issue, it's a regional issue. Simultaneously address, and here's Eddie's comment, wages, food insecurity, health insurance, include homelessness more integrally, integrally in housing strategies. Um, there are some, uh, the, I'm going to read some comments that the community or um, ideas that the community had that has asterisk by them. The asterisk means that these uh, strategies are not currently um, an option for the city of Charleston would require 
state level approval or legislation prior to the city being able to pursue anything like this. So um, the community benefits agreements, one strategy that um, would fall under that category, mandatory inclusionary zoning, then property tax freezes for longtime residents. Um, other things are getting rid of the fee and lieu, uh, repairing maintenance of existing low income housing and improving public transportation options. All right, and um, so some that directly related to that community input, we have um, establishing, uh, working with the Charleston Redevelopment Corporation to establish a land bank uh, to, to uh, put away uh, suitable lands for affordable housing development uh, for the future. Um, in, uh, implement uh, reduced regulatory bar barriers that add time and costs. Um, so, so that's something that we heard, especially uh, with affordable housing developments. Um, and so that's something we've heard, uh, you know, to, to get these projects through the pipeline as quickly as possible, because we know that time is money uh, in housing development. Um, number seven, we have expand uh, incentives for affordable housing. Um, and so, you know, these are, these are things like uh, design related, such as reduced setbacks and lot sizes, uh, unit density bonuses for affordable housing, um, eliminated parking minimums uh, when they're located close to public transit um, and things like that that can reduce the cost of affordable housing development. Um, let's see, we have uh, create more funding streams for affordable housing development through zoning and other planning tools. Uh, an example would be our fee in lieu uh, that was just referred to. Um, let's see, continue to leverage funding opportunities for affordable housing at the state and federal level and advocate for legislation. Um, so that's something that we already do and, and we'll continue doing in the future. Oh, so then we have um, policies, uh, adopt policies uh, to increase housing security for existing residents and areas at risk, uh, risk of displacement. And so I think Chloe uh, mentioned that at the beginning of the presentation that that was one of our three key questions was, at, you know, what, which areas uh, can, can, can we target these policies toward uh, and what specific policies do we need to uh, adopt um, to reduce displacement? Um, and it, and it, we called out here uh, historic African-American settlement communities. So that's a big project um, that Chloe and some others have been working on is uh, identifying those communities around the city because they are numerous. Um, and then, you know, uh, preserving those areas or making sure that new development is in line with those historic African-American settlement communities. Um, then we have, let's see, um, this, uh, I can't remember, What's, oh, I think it's Sandy. Okay, there. <laughs> Sandy, uh, this was Sandy's question um, before, is, uh, you know, how, how can we allocate or uh, resources and staff to assist uh, lower income homeowners on the peninsula uh, maintain, uh, in maintaining their historic homes? And so that's something, uh, you know, that we're interested in doing uh, and, and that we already do, um, but, you know, increasing those resources. Um, Let's see, uh, preserving that naturally occurring affordable housing. That was that 70,000 figure or 76,000 figure that I dropped a few slides ago of those houses that we don't have any control over um, that are af currently affordable. So how can we preserve those? Uh, and then finally, our, our last uh, recommendation is kind of a blanket one and that's to uh, fully imp implement our recommendations from the Housing for a Fair Charleston report. Um, and so a lot of these, uh, that we just called out are already in that report, but uh, we, you know, we still wanted to make sure we covered our covered our bases with all the <laughs> recommendations in that report as well. I got a question um, with respect to the the recommendation you just uh, shared with us. Um, I was looking at five and ten. I believe that's yeah. Is the are those uh, related or they're separate, or they're inclusive. Um, I, I think five is incredibly important because of the fact that, uh, let's see, prioritize investing in long-time residents and business owners. I mean, the, <clears throat> the reason why that is so important is that you have one of the reasons for why so many people want to come here, they want to look and see what was here before. And we need to have uh, we need to have a priority priority 
placed on people with businesses and homes who have been here for 70, 80 years. And that's going to, I think that that, that the question is, that I think that that should be something that the city should invest in. The city should have that as a major priority because, I mean, you can apply for grants and all 24 seven, but people to it, the, 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 the real uh, thrust of, of supporting your own should come from the city. So I, I'm, I want to see the relationship between five and 10, if, if you, Chloe or Jim, um, uh, and are those two, uh, two separate things or are they both interconnected and tied together? So Eddie, is this 10 here, what you're referring to for 10? That 10, yes. Okay. And five, are you referring to the land bank recommendation? Uh, maybe, uh, uh, let's see here. I are you referring, <laughs> you're referring to this here, this top line here, prioritize, invest in long time black residents and business owners? Yeah, yeah, the both, okay. yes, yeah. Okay, so that, that came from the community and the number 10 here is this, um, uh, the recommendation actually for the city plan. So. One is what we heard from the community, and then this is our attempt um, at drafting a recommendation responding to um, what we heard and also what we've seen in the data. Um, so it, if it seems similar, that's good. That means that- Well, that's good. I mean, it's yeah, very good. That means, that, good. means that, yeah. Uh, the question is, um, can, will we be able to, to implement it? Uh, can we make it happen um, so that you know, the, the, the last thing we want to do is 10 years from now, is we said, well, this used to be the Brook Street restaurant and hotel. 10 years, you know, that, that kind of thing. I think, how can, we, how can we expedite and speed this up and place that onus on us, on the city? Because it is our city. <laughs> so, um, so uh, I'm open and, and available for, to hear how, uh, how, how you can help us do that. One thing, one thing I'll, I'll add is that um, with our, our work with community data platforms, you know, we, we now have a lot of information that we didn't before, um, you know, about, you know, things like demographic makeup and dem demographic changes, income changes, uh, the amount of people that are renting versus owning in, our, in a neighborhood, a lot of things that we've uh, learned kind of lead towards that displacement. And so, uh, you know, with this recommendation, it's kind of the first step in, in, in diving into some of that data that we have to identify areas that, you know, might not even be in our, on our radar, but the data might, you know, lead us to a certain uh, neighborhood uh, that could be at risk of displacement. But um, yeah, I think it's a great point. Do you have anything to add, Chloe? No, but I think Gianna did. Thank you, Chloe. Certainly, um, I would answer Eddie's question by saying what you do in your day job, Eddie, relative to preserving housing is an answer to number 10. One of the things that we've talked about throughout the recommendations and even the input that the community has given lends to additional funding. Uh, Last year, probably two years now, uh, Marvin's uh, representative, uh, Marvin Pendarvis and Senator Kempson pushed for a state low income housing tax credit, which increased the number of the amount of funding available to produce housing for rental housing for persons at 60% and below the area median income. That immediately helped those developers, which are not all um, nonprofit, but developers who build multifamily housing to increase the amount of housing that they could build because there was an availability of funds. And so part of one of our thoughts should be, how are our legislators working towards recognizing housing as a right of every citizen, of every resident of the state of South Carolina? And how can we as housing advocates and residents of the city of Charleston keep this priority before them? Because it has to be a priority. For more than 20 years, the Department of Housing and Community Development depended solely on funding from the Department of HUD. 
to facilitate preservation of housing and creation of housing. And I must say, even my predecessors did an amazing job leveraging little funds in order to have the impact that we've had over the years. We've gotten smarter and a little bit more strategic, but even with those strategies, there needs to be more because the problem is so prevalent, the demand is so great. Does that mean we stop doing the things that we know are right? No, not at all. Some of what we've heard and that has uh, been evidenced by the data is nothing new. I remember three years in a row where area median income did not move and costs continued to rise. And so what does that do for an economy? And recognizing, and this is my other point, recognizing and understanding and educating our community on what housing is because it is an economic impetus. It is managed, if you will, or facilitated by what is going on in the economy. So how are we bringing jobs and industry in where we're giving them incentives out of the Wahoo Z and they're paying our residents $8 an hour? You can't afford an apartment on $8 an hour. So I was waiting for the rest of y'all to say this, but since y'all didn't, I thought I'd go ahead and jump in. <laughs> so that some of these issues are how we resolve the, the challenge that's in our state. And this is just not likened to Charleston. You can talk to Jenny in Greenville. You can talk to Deborah in Columbia. Theirs is not as bad as ours in Greenville, but there are some problems and challenges that have persisted for years. So as we as residents and those that have the ears or can get the ears of those folks that make decisions need to say, we need higher wages. That also means we need to educate better. We have an organization that we funded for many years that manages what we call a fair housing hotline. That same organization also provides training for persons who need financial literacy and education. All of those things are important for helping folks to transition from point A to point B. Maybe they're a renter now, maybe they want to be a homeowner, maybe they can't be that immediately, but there are methodologies and ways to do that. I would also say, and I'm just stepping back for a second, the funding that HUD has given us now since 1975, in many cases has decreased over the years um, since we've received it which means we have to be smarter about and we have to leverage more funding in order to still make those initiatives that are facilitating change in communities and change in people's lives. We still have to make that happen. So there has to be demand on leadership in order for change to happen. And uh, we have to be more intentional about seeing programs, initiatives and processes in place and not growing weary. I've grown weary from time to time and I'm in this work every day. Not growing weary when you don't see the evidence, when you have sent out that flyer and sent out that piece of, of um, information relative to housing and you still have NIMBY in your community. They don't want certain housing in certain neighborhoods. Still today in Charleston, we still deal with that. So that's a challenge. So. I would just say to you all, I commend you on the recommendations. I think they're excellent. I would simply add from the standpoint of economics and economic development and, and increasing wages for our residents in the city, whatever that takes. Additional education, on the job training, challenging the Googles and all of these other larger companies to ensure that these folks can get training that enables them to earn the kind of money that is needed to afford yeah. a decent home. Uh, I would just say, and, and Don's not here to talk about it, and I'm going over a lot of stuff, but I was being quiet and now it's all coming out. <laughs> well, Gianna, if I could just share one thing, I'm sorry, I may interrupt you. Yeah. We did have breakouts that we wanted to go into. Oh. Okay, um, no, I mean, I'm not saying what you're saying is not important, but um, <laughs> we just want to take a few minutes to pause to just yes, do a quick break. Good. We only can yeah, do it for maybe about um, six minutes, seven minutes, but yes. if we could just do that and then we could definitely still um, come back and, you know, if there's a couple more minutes, we might be able to, but we want to make sure we can get people out. Um, 